Before we got to uh, <coughs> to uh, Okinawa, an eerie thing happened. There was a full moon, as I recall. We always traveled in uh, in convoys, and so we had line, long line of uh, ships of different kinds. And suddenly we heard a kind of a, a noise, and it was a, a single Japanese plane flying low, flow right through us, and I could see the pilot. Now, he wasn't shooting. He was, I'm, I'm sure, you know, sending reports and lots of ships coming. No one fired him. He didn't fire at us. Uh, but it was an eerie, uh, eerie experience. We did see also, kind of in the horizon, some uh, shooting, and apparently that was between one naval ship and, a, and, a, and some uh, small Japanese naval ship. And uh, the good guys won that one, apparently. Uh, then, uh, then we went to the landing, and that was huge. It was, I think, over a thousand ships of different kinds involved in that landing. Not, not nearly as big as Normandy, but by Pacific standards, this was, well, it was the biggest. Uh, and again, the same scenario of the battleships uh, sh shooting, then follow up. Except this time they had some, at the t tail end, I uh, saw something for, for the first time, some kind of a ship that threw masses of rockets in on, on the landing areas, uh, just creating more dust and sand and so forth. In uh, that particular landing, we did go up on the first day, and we were loaded with ammunition, which uh, fortunately no one shot at us. But during the next, <coughs> uh, I'm talking about April. Well, did you the, also unload the troops there on that island? Uh, we, we, we unloaded the troops offshore. And, uh, but, but, and then later that same day we went up on shore to unroll the, the ammo. Yeah, with the ammo. Um, <clears throat> we saw an awful lot of uh, Okinawa during the next many months, re supply and resupply. I forget for how long that the battle in, in Okinawa took place, uh, uh, continued, but it was a long, long while. And, uh, it was also where the Japanese totally unleashed their their uh, <coughs> kamikaze attacks, but they would <coughs> we'd constantly get what they called general quarters, where they'd get the alarms, dangers approaching. You had to get out of bed and go up and man your battle stations and so on, um, and usually nothing happened. And my particular battle station post was an unfortunate one. It was where you made, made smog. You created kind of an oil mist to, to cloud up the whole harbor and so on, which is not, A, first of all, you couldn't see anything, and, and B, uh, disagreeable from, from the point of view of breathing. But uh, they... James Buckley, a former U.S. Senator from New York, died Friday at the age of 100, according to the Washington Post. Buckley's son confirmed his death to the Washington Post, but did not say the cause. Born in the New York City in 1923, the U.S. Navy veteran was first elected to the Senate in 1970 as part of the Conservative Party of the New York. He was also the brother of the late conservative firebrand William F. Buckley Jr., the founder of the National Review, a conservative magazine. Buckley was the oldest living senator. Buckley is famous for his challenge of campaign finance laws in the landmark Supreme Court case Buckley v. Valeo, in which he was one of the feelers. The case struck down portions of post-Watergate law governing campaign finance. 
Baka lost his Senate seat in a re-election campaign to a Democrat to a Democrat in 1976. The same year he switched to the Republican Party. He later served in the Reagan administration as an undersecretary for security assistance in the U.S. Department of State and was later nominated by Reagan to a position as a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Such so rest in peace and thank you so much.